as part of your learned recently? What have I learned recently? Good question. Um, What have I learned recently? I've learned that every person has their time in their sun, in the sun, and it's you've got to you've got to allow the next generation to come through. As um, watching women's rugby, the women were running a coaching course here, and I went out and helped them. And they were talking about teaching props and setting up and body position and things like that. And I went, oh, yeah, I know that. And I offered some advice as part of the conversation. And they sort of acknowledged it. And then, but they had their own way they were going to deliver it, which uh, there was a. Pr I would call it a really polite rebuttal acknowledgement, but I'll hang on, old fella, we've got it sorted. <laughs> and I watched them, and they did a sterling job. And I just thought to myself, hmm, you've got to allow these people to come through and do their own thing, and just because you did it one way once doesn't make it the only way it can be delivered. So that, that was good. You know, these, the younger coaches coming through, uh, they want to be part of it and deliver and try what they think. So, yeah, I, yeah, reflection was quite good. What else have I been learning lately? You've got to be careful when you interview people. They might be able to talk a good game, but the delivery once they're in the role, could be quite different. So what I mean by that, um, you can have a person who understands the game, has played in that position, and, and understands how to perform, but when they're in the role of coaching, doesn't mean they really understand the artistry of teaching, which is one thing I've observed. And fortunately, this young fellow that I'm observing wants to learn. And the key thing is he didn't know what he didn't know. But as soon as you bring it to their attention, they go, oh, thanks for that. And, but that, that ability to create awareness and give them strategies, techniques in order to learn for themselves is a big part of the coaching, which doesn't al you don't always see in an interview. So you've got to be really specific, I think, when you're interviewing. How would you teach? Mm. What teaching strategies have you got? I would go so far as to say that the interviews today, you should have a section of your interview about understanding the game, understanding the intricacies of the role that you're putting them into, and then I'd stop the so-called formal bit of the interview then I'd take them outside, ask them what, what area of the game you're most comfortable with. If they said um, forward play, I'd say, right, here's 10 boys. I want you to take them for a session on run, catch, pass. Simple back play. And I said, I'll, I'd say to them, I'll give you... 10 minutes to prepare, and um, then you've got to run a 15 minute session. Let's see how you go. And there'll be a few things in that. I'd probably tell them there'll be a practical coaching session, but I wouldn't tell them what it's going to be. 
So that could cause them a little bit of stress and see how they work there. Uh, be in an area they weren't completely familiar with, so there's a little bit more stress. With 10 people who they know nothing about. So in that 15 minute session, you probably want to spend two of them figuring out who and what's standing in front of you mm. and then just go from there. But I think unless you know or have observed coaches coaching and teaching, I think you're leaving it to chance if you don't really observe them doing their key job. How's that for a two things I've learnt this week. Incredible. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and something, you know, when you, 100%, and uh, oh, a couple of things on that, but one thing I just thought when you were talking about the getting 10 people and coach them, and something I was thinking about with coaching recently is that, you know, you make session plans and all that, and of course, and you got in, you, you have bigger plans and all that sort of stuff, but I think or feel what are your thoughts but that coaching like playing you have to go into the moment and get a feel of the session versus being at 10,000 feet and saying we're doing x we're doing this and this mm. now this now this now this and to run it as it as you had it on the script do you know what I mean like to get it like as a player, you're, you're completely in, you want to be completely in the moment, catching the ball, moving with the ball, moving with the play. Like I know when I feel I'm coaching my best, when I love it, I'm, I'm running around, like I'm doing small side games, I'm kind of running around with them as well, I'm getting a feel of it as well, you know what I mean? And, and with your timings, with different stuff. Um, the first description you put across there, Brian, was you've got your session plan, mm. I'm going to teach these boys one, two, three, four, five, six. And you go through and you teach them one, two, three, four, five, six. That is quite common. However, that doesn't take into account in any way, shape, or form who and what's standing in front of you. Mm. What it's all about is you, the coach, you're coaching for yourself. Mm. Because you've got six things together to get across. If I don't get these things across, I'm not as good a coach as I think I am. So it's about you, you, you're looking at it through your lens of perspective. In actual fact, you've got to look through the learner's lens. So you might have six bits of information you want to get across. It's all relevant to how well the athletes in front of you learn you may only get to three of those points and that's the way it is I'll, next time I'll come back and I'll reconfirm those three and then I'll move on to the next three but it's no use teaching them six bits of information and then wondering where it's all gone because they can't perform it in the game, which is the ultimate test of your teaching. And as it is, if it's new to them, it's going to take a while anyway. You know, two, two to three weeks of repeated effort. And then you're going to have to put it in games without pressure, with pressure, as you build up to putting them in and you'll hopefully you'll see small glimpses of it what you've been teaching them in the game and then they'll get familiar with it so yeah um, you do have to get a feel but it's more about again what I was saying before going back to understanding what your ultimate role is it is to teach and the, this the student turns up to learn when he's ready. So you've got to engage with them, find out where they
the rat on that day, what mood they're in, yeah. the down or up or whatever. So you, you might have to have a bit of an icebreaker, a bit of humour, build that connection. Then you've got to explore what they do know about the particular points you're teaching. And, you know, point one, they might be quite familiar with it. Great, let's move straight on past that and we'll go to point two. You might ascertain that, well, actually, they don't know about this. T they don't know this too well. Um, we'll spend a bit more time here. Yeah, so it's all about the student. It's all about the athlete. And, um, yeah, it's athlete-centred coaching. Yeah, 100%. And I think a part of it then is, as well, not wanting things to be perfect or I think that's a big thing sometimes with coaches, like you're coaching and I know I, when I was starting out and it's like, be it the session itself, like you said beforehand, you have your six points and then if you don't get through your six points and if this isn't all done this way, then it's not perfect and then you as a coach aren't fulfilling your role and then if on a Saturday it's not perfect, then then it's no good, you know what I mean? Like, whereas it's just, it's never going to be perfect. It doesn't, you know, it's... Yeah, yeah it's... Coaching today, you've got to understand so much about learning how people learn, mm. how to transmit your messages. Do they need to see it? Do they need to do it? Do they need a bit of paper to read it? Can I use videos? Can I demonstrate? Can I explain it? Can I practice it? Uh, when I practice it, do I do it at no pressure? Do I do full noise and then come back? Do I go hard, soft, hard? So hard is under pressure, soft is no pressure. Back to hard again. Do I utilise teaching games for understanding or game sense approach? Uh, what questioning can I have? Um, there's a whole range of teaching strategies now that coaches have to understand. Um, because and intertwined with all that, the athlete today want to know why I'm learning it. Mm. How am I going to use it in the game? Is this relevant to me? So your why has to be in there as well. Um, so yeah, it's the learning can be as messy for the player as it is for the coach. Because the coaches think, well, why can't you why can't you do it and understand it? Because I've just spent thirty five minutes teaching you. It's not my fault, I've done my job. Mm -hmm. Well, I think every time you go to a coaching course, one of the things you should be given is a mirror. So you can look at yourself because the issues generally are within yourself. He may not have learned it because I don't understand how he learns. So I've got to change how I teach. And I might have three different, three different groups of people in my standing in front of me who all learn differently. Mm -hmm. So if I'm concentrating on one mode of learning, I've lost the other two, and it's not their fault, it's mine. So, yeah, coaching's, coaching's challenging. It's not easy, but it's great fun. Mm -hmm. And there's a great deal of enjoyment derived from it when you do see them pick it up. It's brilliant. Yeah, and so like <clears throat> with that, say with the different types of learning, if you had a team, you kind of go through a, few, a couple of different ways of learning. And I think then as a coach, you need to not somewhat nearly get offended if someone isn't fully engaged in one way of learning. So well, what I'm kind of thinking is, if you were to be putting PowerPoint slides up, 
you will have pl exactly you'll have some players that are like clued in and yeah. you have some players that are asleep at the back yeah. or if you're doing a walkthrough you know you have some players that are clued in some that aren't and then you're doing it in a game or you know say huddle these days or video like you know i'd send out videos and you might see there's 15 people watch it but there's 40 in the squad and it's like yeah. but that's because the others don't watch it it's not like they just that's not their way of learning you know what i mean and so they'll pick it up another way so you kind of then as a coach need to be thinking about how are the different ways that you'll hit it mm. and i think you've also got to understand them so it's no use forcing a player to have a notebook when he never writes down anything anyway yeah um i've come across one all black who never had a notebook in his whole professional career. But he was very tuned in. He just didn't take notes. Um, I know of an All Black, not current, recent All Black, who did very little vi video analysis of the opposition because he didn't care about them. He ate, all his video analysis was of himself and how he dealt with situations, and he backed himself to be able to deal with any situation that he was presented with. So just because they don't do it the way you want it to do doesn't make it wrong, as long as it works for them. And for that to happen, you've got to understand them. You've got to spend a bit of time asking those questions. How do you learn? They may not know. You might have to figure that out together but one of the <clears throat> best bits of professional development I did on myself was I went and um, watched primary school teachers teach in a classroom and I might have talked to you, you before about this they were you didn't want first year year one kids in the primary school. Th these kids were about nine or ten. And the reason that I went there is I didn't need to know how to teach maths. What I wanted to know and learn was how this teacher controlled the classroom, created the learning environment, and um, the classroom, how it was set up into different areas where she could have 26, she had a, I think it was 23 children in the class and they would all break out into learning groups mm. and they were self-directed to some degree. She says, well, this group, you're doing this. There's your resources, go. Another group over here. And she might be working with the third group, but she controlled the other group through eye contact and body language. Quite often she didn't say a word, it was just a look, a name, a point, a gesture, mm. and that, and questioning. Like we say in coaching, get your hands up. She would have said, where are your hands, Freebie? So I've got to figure it out mm. for myself. Are they where I sh should have them? little things like that so that was really good and then how she set up the classroom and in the um, uh, colour uh, posters artefacts um, reminders of how we do it lists um, yeah it was it was probably one of the best things I ever did early on for my coaching is watching someone who really loved their profession and, and was very good at their trade, the artistry of coaching. And you quite often we've spoken about the science versus the artistry of coaching. And it's over time it's that artistry of knowing who and what's standing in front of you, knowing yourself, and then 
bring the two together so that you can better best support uh, those that have given up their time to allow you the privilege of coaching and teaching them. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think that understand, you mentioned a couple of times, that understanding the person is, is first and foremost, isn't mm. it? And uh, building relationships with your players um, is really important. Um, like I said, early on I tried to be liked and it was a horrendous mistake. Um, so I wouldn't tell the players what they actually needed to know about themselves. I'd tell them what they wanted to know about themselves. But I was missing the point of actually to correct that behaviour, you need to have this. And over time what I learned about myself was that I tended to avoid conflict. However minor that conflict was, but that was in my own makeup. And then I learned that, you know, just because we're going to have a challenging conversation, it's not personal. It's not a personal attack mm -hmm. on you. And I learned I had to learn how to frame up those conversations. Brian, let's go and have a chat. How do you think you're getting on at uh, the game on Saturday? And you might self-justify or yeah, give, yeah. give an answer, and I'll say, well, I don't think you did because here's the evidence. You're not doing what we asked you to do. So how can we get you to play better? What, what, how can I support you to allow you to play the game that I know you're capable of? Mm. So framing up a mm. conversation and language is really important so that it's not an, a direct attack. It's, it's saying to you, you're wrong. It's not what you believe to be correct is not correct. Here's the evidence. Mm. But I'm not attacking you. I know you're capable of doing this. How can I support you to get there? Um, and then it might be something in your preparation, in your performance. It might be that you've got problems going on in life but you've got to allow that, you've got to set up that conversation so that you can learn that. And you just hope that your relationships sunk at a point where they, they can share that with you and you can help them. And that's when it's bigger than the game. It's about helping the person be a better version of themselves. And that's, I think that ultimately that's the beauty of our sport, that yeah, we're here about the game, but actually the good coaches are really good at helping people be better people around all those attributes that make up life. Mm. Yeah. And so many of them that fit into, like, are directly correlated. You know, there's so many of those, like life and rugby, like those yeah. attributes that fit seamlessly in and out of both. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, and I think today, <coughs> completely, may, maybe off subject, but more and more, your local rugby club's a safe haven. It's a safe place. You don't know what these other young kids, men and women, have got going in their lives mm. away from you. And they come to that rugby club for a reason. Friendship, safety, I'm not judged. I can be who I want to be. I can be with my mates, whatever the reason is. Um, and quite often you're not privileged to that until you get to know them and have that conversation with them and hopefully you've set up such or you've created such an environment 
that when they do have that bit of adversity, they can come and seek some guidance and, and help from you. Um, because we're seeing more and more cases with mental health, um, which is really, um, can be quite challenging. And, and with us here at Burnside, we've got uh, quite a strong strategy about developing understanding and how to recognise and as, I'll use the word assist people with their challenges mm -hmm. because we make it very very clear we're not counsellors however if somebody comes and confides in you that they do have some challenges in life we know how to support them and find them the professional help and we know how to monitor them and put uh, support package as far as the rugby club is concerned around them. I think that's more and more becoming evident in modern society. Um, so going back to the rugby club, you know, and your coaching, you've You've got these coaches that have to understand the game, have to be able to teach it, have to be able to be a bit of a welfare package, and it all centres around relationships, getting to know them, understand them, understand what you are as a coach, and, and understanding what you're not. I'm not a counsellor. I don't have the answers for you, but I'm happy to listen and help. So, who the hell would be a coach today? <laughs> Great fun. Oh, yes, yeah. It's right. the most re one of the most rewarding jobs in life is coaching and helping somebody. Mm. It's great fun. Yeah, and I think you're so spot on in the, the understanding, like taking a step back and like when something doesn't go as you feel it should from a player be it they're five minutes late or you know the, some t you know some of these little things i think yeah because you never know what's going on in someone you know in someone else's life or what's happening with them mm -hmm. and to you know not to be oh, boom da, 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 and dressing them down or you know like it's just not it's just not it's not right because yeah, you, you just never know these days. Like maybe any days. Mm. Yeah, it's it's it can be you can make coaching as simple or as complicated as you want. Yeah. You can stand there and instruct and tell your players, This is how I want you to play. Do this, do this, uh, do that and, and you're in total control. And if they don't do it, God help them. But the, that's not teaching. And there's no, that's, that's being in total control. Where you can be in control of the environment, but not controlling. So you can control, this is how I think we should play. This is the framework I want to have our game in. But you go out there and play. You use that framework. Mm. But if you end up doing something different, so be it. Mm. The greatest thing that we'll learn is why did you do that? Mm. And if it was a good decision, uh, because you, you saw the picture and you made a good decision, great. We, we, that's a bit of learning for us. And we, we'll, if we recognise that picture again in the field, we can probably do the same thing. So you, you can be in control without being controlling. So and that's where you know they talk about coaches having to be vulnerable. 
it's because you've got to give up a bit of control and let the players assume ownership of it because ultimately it's them playing the game and you can work players extremely hard but they'll still find it fun mm. if they've got a degree of control and enjoyment out of it and ultimately that's what you want you want them to enjoy the experience explore opportunities that appear in the rugby field for themselves mm -hmm. and have that team cohesion to actually give it a crack um, yeah I don't know if I've answered mm. your question or I don't know what the question was I don't know what the question was Frank, well, yeah, no, 100%. And, uh, yeah, the control in the environment versus being controlling. And, play, like, when you give up ownership, like, players will... Like, I remember, you know, when I was eight, 1920 and being pushed as hard as I've ever been pushed. Um, Connacht under-20s, but the most fun I've ever had because I wanted it. Mm -hmm. you know, like, we wanted to be pushed more and more. Like, we were... We wouldn't be able to walk nearly at the end of a Friday at the end of the week um and the in it was just it was grueling to an extent but they were like we we're playing lots of games lots of sm you know games and it was just so enjoyable you know and it was like that it was within a framework we had an idea of how we wanted to play and we were being helped along the way but we had kind of control within it and we were able to make mistakes and find out what worked and what didn't and learn ourselves while be being helped along that way and it was um and yeah as i said we got pushed so much but it was it was us being challenged to reach our best selves it was you know they were creating the environment to challenge us so much that we would have to be our best version mm. and that's that, that goes back to understanding who and what's standing in front of you mm. Because if you're in a performance team, I call it a performance team, that's playing representative rugby, they're all driven, most of them would be driven by the desire to be the best rugby player they can be mm. right here and now. Mm. Where in your club competition, you've got to probably three key groups you've got a third that aspire mm -hmm. a bottom third that just want to participate and are there with their mates and a middle group who I just like it mm. now as a coach you've got to cater to all those those mm. three groups and then you've got those that can perform a skill those that are, have difficulty performing a skill you've got to mesh them together um, yeah, it's it's not easy being a coach, but there's some great challenges there, and it keeps coming back to how how, how what do they enjoy about the game, what are they prepared to do about the game, and for the game, and how can I just push them a little bit further so that they can be better and better each day. And then you've got to work out, you've got to stand back and create the environment where doing it at training is not going to be enough. You've got to put in the, your own effort. So, you know, if I'm doing an activity as a coach for eight, nine, ten minutes, that's not going to make you the mm. best version of yourself. You're going to have to put some time and effort into your own development and do your own reps type thing. So you see, hopefully you can create the environment where before training and after training, they're putting that bit of extra work in. One of the things, ah, here we go. That's something I learned this week. Back to the original question. Uh, what have I learnt this week? Had a 
discussion around visualisation and how to use it. I was at uh, Rugby Park with the NPC boys and I said to them, I said to one of the coaches actually, do you use visualisation with the players prior to doing any technique stuff? He says, oh, yeah, good point. No, I haven't. I said, did you use it when you were a player? He said, yes, I did on game day. And that was, I spoke to another couple of players and it always come back to, yes, I did use it. Generally didn't use it enough, was one of their comments. And the other comment was, I used it on game day. And we spoke about how, how did you use it? And they said, I used it from a bird's eye view around the game and my mm. role within the game and how my running lines and that. And then I used it through my own eyes around those key techniques within <coughs> my role of the tackle, the jackal, the prop, things like that. Um, and then I said, the conversation moved on to, could you, you, did you use it much in your day-to-day -day training? And he said, no, probably something I could do better with. So visualisation is something the sports psychs will talk about, but I think um, we probably don't, the average rugby player doesn't use it enough, and your amateur club coach probably has varying degrees of thought on it, mm. but I think it's an underused tool around it's something that we can very quickly utilise in our trainings that hopefully the players will pick up as a tool that they can use themselves. So yeah, yeah. visualisation. Big time. Man, it's, it's obviously, um, yeah, I love it. And it's funny you say that yesterday morning I was on a, a Zoom call with an under 15 team in Ireland. So I was doing a mental skills Zoom call with them. And one big, one thing their coach said was, look, they on big days they kind of free it, they've frozen a little bit in the past you know you go into when there's people in the crowds and um, that's a challenge and so visualization is the tool for that in that your subconscious mind does not know the difference between something you think and something that ha you see in real life something that's happening so that's why it's powerful that you and from what I've le read and from myself and what, from what I understand you want to be doing the seeing it through your eyes because you can feel it then. Mm -hmm. If you lie down, you, you see yourself playing and you can see the opposition and you can feel, you can feel the catch the ball, it's, you're feeling it. Versus if it's bird's eye, don't get me wrong, just, I haven't done it but that much, but I would imagine it's more difficult to feel it when you're looking down bird's eye. Mm -hmm. And when you're visualizing and you're feeling it, you're firing the same neurons you know, in your brain and they've done studies that you visualize and kicking goals and you actually kicking goals, you improve your goal kicking mm. by visualizing nearly just as much. They've done, the studies have been done. And a way I explained it to these kids, essentially, 14 <coughs> year old, 15 year old kids who want to, and my, you know me, like my whole thing is I want players to enjoy the game and love, and because when they're enjoying it, mm. they're gonna play their best, straight up. And I've been there on big days when I was a kid and you kind of, oh, and it's very difficult to enjoy it. And then at the end, you've played, you've played this big day that you wanted to play and you haven't really enjoyed it and you haven't played well and it's not the experience that you want it to be. And so what I was saying to them is, has anyone ever daydreamed about rugby? Has anyone ever been sitting in the class, looking out the window and thinking, thinking about the game you're gonna play this weekend? Mm. Or when you're lying in bed, thinking about your rugby? Everyone, I was on a Zoom call, I couldn't quite see it, but a lot of the hands went up, you know, I couldn't. <laughs> the way the computer was positioned, but like, I used to do that all the time as a kid. Like, I don't know, did you or, you think about the game and, yeah. 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 And that's visualization. You dream about Straight up, black. exactly. That is visualization. Mm -hmm. This whole, this big word, this big mumbo jumbo, all this stuff, 
And I often still will be walking along and kind of do a bit of a step or a bit of a catch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And no, that's my, my days are sleeping yeah. hard. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's so simple. You get well, me? They had some value to that. Um, when I was talking to the players, they'd start off with a bird's eye view so that they could see the, the strategy and frame the map and that. Yeah. But they'd always come back and finish through your eyes and you're quite right in what you say around the senses, the smell, mm. the feel. Um, the uh, touch. Oh yeah, feeling the impact. hit. Impact, I've been tackled, you know, just your eyes closed, all those sorts of things. But one of the comments that came out from uh, uh, one of the players, a winger actually, he said, when I did do it, I was in the zone. I was acting on instinct. If I hadn't done the visualisation or enough of it, I was always overthinking the game. And I was, by the time I'd figured it all out, a player had moved on. And he said that's when he learned, right, visualisation has got to be part of my prep the night before, the day of, and he said he, he would quite often just end up in the zone, would, would instinctively recognise and react to things and wouldn't, in his term, his words, wouldn't end up overthinking the game. Mm. And he, he, he even said then that he didn't do it enough. So mm. Yeah, it's because you've you feel like you've been there before, so you can relax into it. Whereas yeah. if you are going into the game without visualizing, it's the unknown, and it's kind yeah. of you're over. You're trying to analyze everything. Whereas if you've, as you say, you've you've been you've been visualizing this game. You see the opposition in their yellow jerseys, and you see your teammates, and you see the you know the stadium or the whatever the pitch, and the condition, and it's just like you, yeah, you can switch off. You just yeah, yeah. it's class. Yeah. So yeah, that was. Something come out today? Yeah, cool. Come out last night, actually. So, yeah. And I, and I think um, when you mention you speaking about coaches, so, like, player, a player can lead that themselves for their own prep, like yeah. you mentioned, but then coaches, like, yeah, like, you can lie everyone down. Lie everyone down and, and do it as a team. Like, yeah. why not for seven, eight minutes? Think about the time you think about, and this like, obviously this is my bias, but like, if you have an hour and a half with them, why not seven eight minutes? Lie down, and you bring them through it, and then they see the opposition, and then you know, and, and the pre match, yeah. you visualize the dressing room, you walk them through it, get on the bus, get off the bus, tog out, go out into the field, do the warm up here. That's the opposition. See it. Some of them might fall asleep. All good. They'll still get relaxation out of it. Yeah. And then some of them there. And then you help them. You coach them to visualize. And then they go, "Geez, that worked." Yeah. You know, versus you as a coach never doing visualization. All right, boys on the field. We don't have much time today. Yeah. Well, <coughs> to add some value to that, the. The first 15 minutes of our coaching sessions have come a long way over the years. We'd walk out, stretch a few muscles and then slowly work into it. Some of us wouldn't even stretch a few muscles, <laughs> we'd just slowly work into it. Yeah. Today, you've got all these primers, uh, it's a managed warm-up, jumping, bouncing, all sorts of plyometrics. Uh, we're catching w tennis balls mm. and simple jugglings to fire up the, mm. the visual and neuromuscular things. Part of that warm-up as well is, radio mentally prepare yourself for this training. Mm. Key focus points are, mm. whatever it is, they should be able to operate their brain separately here up from their body warming up here down because that can be a tra challenge. You know, getting themselves present at the training because their brain might be thinking about work this afternoon mm. or the problem I've got when I go home or, oh, shit, you know, got to pay this bill. By telling them or asking them because you can't check it, 
put your saying to them. In this warm up, I also want you to have get ready for a training mentally. I want you to focus on your individual to identify two goals for you in this training. Focus on your key role when we come to do our units. And the second thing I want you to do is focus on the two, three, three strategies you've got for the opposition on Saturday. You've got seven minutes. So how they do, uh, do it is up to them. But they should be able to get themselves mentally ready to train. Now that's part of coaching the co that's training our brain to be in sync with what we're wanting to do. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, and uh, yeah, like showing the session plan before is yeah. very important for that. Yeah, so show them the session plan. They understand what they're training. There's no secrets. Yeah. Um, because you've got to me mentally get ready. Now, you might not have that five minutes or three or four minutes of cl quiet time where you're closing your eyes and actually doing that visualisation, but you're act stimulating and activating the brain for what you know is coming in the next hour, hour and a half. Mm. And, and that's, that's a skill. It's something we probably don't do enough of formally in cueing the players to do that. So yeah, I think there's lots of opportunity there. Yeah, definitely like um yeah, like before each training, set yeah, set very simple. Setting it out, kind of what the objective is very quickly and yeah, giving them a moment to, yeah, I love that. And giving mm -hmm. you know So I'll give you an example of it. The FP women's FPC team. Most teams now have a strategy. If something happens, come into the huddle, deep breaths, key points, move on. Most teams do that on a Saturday. FPC, the women's FPC team, do that in every transition from an activity. So they'll go into a huddle, deep breaths, eyes up, ears open, two key points from the session we've just done, radio, Fruby, tell me what we're doing in the next part of the activity, uh, we're going to uh, attack coach and we're going to work on this, great, let's go. So they're practicing every element of their game in their trainings, they, they're not leaving it to chance. So I think that's, that's a key thing we've got to make sure we do as coaches as well. We, we do things on Saturday that we don't always train mm. Tuesday and Thursday. And it's those little things that you do, you do them well enough, they become habitual. Mm. And they have a policy where only the leaders talk in their huddle or if the captain nominates someone they don't, so they call it hustling. They, if something goes down, you've got to have hustle to get to the circle, get your breath, eyes up, ears open, listen, and if you want to have micro conversations, you have that when on the way there or when you disperse. So you don't have a whole lot of people talking, it's just the key points. So they got a clear process for that, and they train it. Mm. That's that's what the beauty of it. So if you've got a process, and you assume they know it, it's not their fault when it doesn't work. Because the assumption you've made is we've talked about it and we do it on Saturday. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're leaving it to yeah, chance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Train it. Practice it. Yeah. Make it part of your training routine. Yeah. Brilliant, yeah. And a good um one that just came up actually in a podcast <coughs> I was doing there a couple of days ago. I don't know when I'll put this one out or that one out or whatever. <laughs> um but was we were chatting about um 
relaxation and um, you know like switching off and the necessity you know you can't be for 80 minutes of a game you can't be 100% focused you need moments where you relax and when you get the water like exactly that you take a breath you get the water and um, the ball's kicked into the stand half time is the time if there's a break in play you know you can just you can mentally um, relax and we were talking about um, sin bins and how that's a, an opportunity for the player to relax and calm down the mind and calm the body and recover. So to recover, recover, calm the mind and yeah, slow the heart rate down through the breathing and use that as a recovery period so that they can then get out and fire when they get back on. But I would imagine that most times when people get yellow carded, they sit there and their thoughts start spiraling. Mm. I'm letting the team down. What are the coaches going to say to me? I'm, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that 10 minutes becomes probably a very difficult place to be. And we were just chatting about, yeah, like how many teams, are, is there a team in the world that practice sin bins during, during trainings? Because nearly every game there's a sim, well, at the top, like there's very often yellow cards. A lot of teams will train for the result of a sim bin. We're playing with 14. Exactly. We're, we're playing with exactly. 13. Yeah, exactly. What, and I don't know, but actually teaching your players when you're in the sim bin, here's a strategy. Here's a breathing strategy. And it reminds me of. Um, the police, um, the SAS, those high performance environments that are dealing with life and death situations, they spend a lot of time of being calm mm -hmm. and they learn how to monitor their heart rate in a st highly stressful situation so that they're not in panic mode, they are in control and how to get their heart rate back down very quickly, mm. which is a relaxation technique, mm. which, you know, when you're doing gut buster workout, I think that, okay, stand up straight, go through your heart rate routine, your lower, we want you to, practice this breathing strategy so you can lower your heart rate and it might take you four minutes but you're going to condense that time down over the course of a season so rightio you've got 30 seconds go through your routine of breathing and physically lowering relax going through a muscle relaxation and, and lower your heart rate right you're gone again Oh, it's so funny. You weren't at the Canterbury 19s last night. I did that with them. Ah. Yeah, so what I did is I got a... I did exactly what you just said. I got um, Gunny to uh, dress them down, yeah. essentially, at the end of a contact session. So the contact gets them fired and fit, like gets them a bit exhausted, yeah. and then got him to dress them down, essentially, say, you're not up to it, da 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 that's not good enough. Yeah. You know, the old school. And... Yeah and went at them for 30 seconds or a minute. And then, you know, a couple, it was kind of like people, you know, the, like looking around like, oh, we're getting, we're getting told off here. And then I brought them over and it's exactly what you did. Because yeah. in two, three weeks ago, I laid them down and did the kind of meditation, relaxation yeah. stuff so that they got a understanding of what slowing your breathing down is and slowing the mind and all that stuff. And I just said to them like, then after I said to them beforehand, I'm go you're going to be challenged at one point. We're going to practice that breathing, that calming down and refocusing, and then did that. And then I yeah, brought them on for 30 seconds. And then it was like, all right, now um, focus into your next job, attack. Yeah. So to just try and because everyone talks about it, just something I was kind of thinking about recently. Everyone talks about oh, next job, just have a move on to the next job. But do we ever practice it? Yeah. So that was that. So I think. One of the sports psychologists I s listened to, she called that win-win. Win the moment, win the next moment. So winning the moment was controlling yourself, 
Mm. Therefore, you're better able to prepare yourself for the next moment. I'm not sure I've got the terminology right, but it was calm yourself down, be present, mm. so we can win the next moment. Mm. And it was being and it was being grounded. Control your breathing, lower your heart rate, be present. Therefore, I'm better able to win the next moment. So if I win this, I can win that. 100%. 100%. And a, a key part of that is awareness of your feelings, mm -hmm. you know? And it's for life or rugby. And um, so your feelings being like frustration, anger, you know, like if you've just conceded a try to, to bring awareness to that, how, so that you can then relax, you know, and become present. Because that's when people don't, you know, they lose the head or they, yeah. it's, it, it blows up. Yeah. One of the courses I did years ago uh, was a learned optimism course. Because by nature, I'm a catastrophizer, so I can take a problem and make it into a volcano in the blink of an eye when I was younger. Yeah. And it didn't result in anger, it was just all on the inside, yeah. emotionally. And I attended this learned optimism course which said, you know, the problem's not permanent, it's generally not of your making, there is a solution, you've just got to stay calm and figure it out. And there was a whole lot of science behind mm. it. But once you realise what's happening to you, you can deal with it. Like, breathing's part of it, but just having that awareness that, yeah, I can feel the emotion rising up into me, mm. inside of me. Right out. There's a solution here. I've just got to mm. take the time to find it. And eventually... Like now, it just becomes instinct. If somebody says, um, this isn't working, okay, give me a solution. I haven't got one. Right out. Right out. Stop what you're doing. We'll, we'll do this. We'll do that. Um, so that ability to acknowledge mm. what's happening to you mm. and then have the strategies to deal with it. And that might be a process, but over time it can just... Mm. Have help him. Yeah, but that understanding how to breathe, so that you expand the diaphragm and what a deep breath is and what is, what it's not, in order to get that oxygen in your system. Um, is a skill. Is a, something that's got to be trained. Mm. And that acknowledge is huge too. Like kind of like acknowledge and accept. Yeah. You know and like when you can see the try or when you yeah. something happens or that acknowledge except like I'm here now this has happened and the uh, then the the win winner then the present and the yeah. let's go again like an example in the rugby team is you'll know there are r rugby teams that will niggle you mm, just trying exactly. to niggle you what they're actually trying to do is put you off your game so if you react they've won mm. Now, does it mean you let them push and shove you around? No, you stand your ground. <coughs> but what you don't want to do is retaliate because they've won. Because if they're trying to niggle you, they're not thinking about their game. They're not present in the moment right there and then. Mm. If you retaliate, you're not present about the next moment. So if you stand your ground, acknowledge I know what you're trying to do to me, that's fine, I'm off to the next part of this gig. You're actually ahead of them because they've got to recalibrate their brain for the next activity. Your brain's already present. You know what you're going to do. I just acknowledge what, I know what you're trying to do, acknowledge it, don't react to it, radio scrum. I got you, Sonny, because I know that you're not in, you're not... Mm. Your brain's not in the game. It's 30 seconds late. Mm. So how coaches put that across is the reason why it comes back to if you explain that to them, 
they understand the reason why, they, therefore there's some value in learning that technique, that strategy, um, and they'll train it, practice it. Yeah, 100%. And within that, then, I think what can, what can be good as well, and I've experienced of it, but one or two players, it can be their game to niggle mm. the other opposition and that can be their game and they can be in the moment present with that and mm. I remember one years ago um, playing at Lansdowne against Clontarf and Mike Ruddock um, said that their nine er, was the heartbeat of their team everything was through the nine you know the nine was just and he was a great player and said um, we need to take him off his game and then explained a couple of things and so I did it and um, he said the early doors, if you see him in a rock, just grab him, pull him close, hold him on the ground and then keep doing it. And so I remember like early, like five minutes in, I was there and just saw him like he was at, uh, close to a rock and just went through, grabbed him, pulled him down and just pull as close as you can, their collar to your collar and then just hold them. And then they start like trying to punch and swing and kick and you just tuck in and hold. And yeah. then there's two phases going on here and they've got no nine. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just me, a second row, who's just like hanging out there. And anyway, threw their game off, and I think I don't know. I don't know if they were in the game or not, but I, I enjoyed I enjoyed that game within the game, and that like and that's that's coaching too, yeah. you know. It's a mental game. Right, yeah. So these are a few things I've learnt this yeah. week. What else? What else? Uh, one other one. One other one I thought of actually. One last one, but um, what team would you like to coach at the World Cup? If you're to coach at this World Cup. 2003 World Cup, what team would I like to coach? I'd like to coach the All Blacks because I think they're going to win it. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. What makes you think that the All Blacks are going to win it? I just think they've come through a bit of adversity, both the coaching group and the players. Um, I think that they are a very tight-knitted group. I think Ian Foster's made some changes to how they're going to play. I think, and by that I mean, I think he's taught the team to recognise better, more consistently, the opportunities that are in front of them. So I think in the pr past year or two, they might have played a system or a strategy um, for a situation in the field. I think he's got them to a point where they can, at this point we normally box kick, hold mm. on, there's a three on two over here, we'll go. Mm. I think they're more confident and their ability to read a situation and play it. And he, he's given them the license to do that, the expectation of the coaching group to do that. And it's simple, like, he, he, I suspect he's been asking them in the training, what was the picture you saw? What was the picture you missed? Mm. What did we do? Why did you do that? Great, it was a good decision. Why did you do that? There was an opportunity over here. Why did we not take it? Well, it wasn't communicated. Great, let's learn from that communication. Mm. Oh, yeah, I, I just think they're evolving and they'll peak at the moment. I think they've got a good blend of youth. <laughs> experience and talent you need all three probably got enough best in the world players to exploit opportunity and they've got enough world class players to back up the best in the world and then they've got some young guns that will just be chomping at the book to have a crack and they'll turn up with it, no fear. 
there's really got nothing to worry because it's their first poem. They've got nothing, no, no they're not carrying any baggage or history. They'll play without fear. Mm. So, yeah. Team I'd like to coach, All Blacks, there's my reason why. I think they'll go deep into the com competition. Won't be easy. Um, there'll be some random factors come into it. Injury. To watch players get injured. Um, but I think they'll go deep and win it. Mm, they are so impressive this, since it's re resumed. Yeah. And exactly... 100% agree with what you're saying in that um, the way they're reading the pictures in front of them and as well as that, the pace that they're playing at. And I can just imagine what their trainings are like, you know, like the, the tempo that they're playing at a make, you know, because you have to be at breakneck speed if you're going to read in the moment because at international level, the moments go like that. Mm. You get me? So you can't think about it. Mm got to play on instinct. Instinct comes from having been there, done that, got my mental game squared away, um, head on a swivel, mm. all those cliches that we've used, they just happen. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's they've, oh, they've come back too strong and I think our, it's a uh, is it Ireland have France or New Zealand in a quarter? I think it's either or. France just yeah. lost their 10 in Tamaki. Yeah. But they have like another three tens that are, you know, mm. they have so many players. They have such depth. Yeah. No, it'll be a very interesting competition. And if the All Blacks don't win, the sideshow will be, always be able to watch Eddie Jones's. Yeah. <laughs> Media interviews. Yeah. It'll be fantastic, mate. Oh, my word. Oh, yeah. He's an interesting character. But yeah. Mate, the guy could be <coughs> right. Who knows? Yeah. Because they've got an easy, well, not an easy, but... Well, the Australians can play rugby. Yeah. Don't get it wrong. They, they will surprise somebody. Mm. Yeah. If it clicks for them and they get that confidence. And they get out of their group and then yeah. they get a, a quarter final win. It's all on. Yeah. Any dark horse, do you think, or anything oh. anything else? Or? Mate, having said the All Blacks will go deep and win it. France. Yeah. Australia. Probably not the dark horse, but the team I'll be interested in watching is England. Because mm. they actually haven't done anything. Yeah. And how Steve Wolfwick gets them to win games will be fascinating. Because mm. they'll either implode or explode. Mm. And, you know, if they get it right. Yeah, it'll be interesting because they haven't set the world alight. And then you've got Scotland who are playing a great band of brand of rugby, but they get got to get a lot. They've got to have a lot go their way to go deep. But you know they're capable, and, and that's tournament and one-off matches you know one-off matches you've got a bit of time to recover and organize things but tournament play the deeper you go the more you've got to play your best players game after game mm. after game so how do you get your top players to the quarterfinals in a reasonable shape so that they can play two more games after that at the highest level in the world that's where um, depth of talent and just mental strength etc will come up I just think every team's a case study of one and they're all capable and it'll be really interesting Yeah, like Georgia will scare somebody yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's 
physically intimidating human beings. Yeah. And if they can lock into a scrum and set piece battle, mm. get penalties Ooh. and penalties, kick corners, get mauls. Imagine getting hit by one of them as they're running into a boulder. Yeah. Those Georgians, yeah. <laughs>